welcome to another sermon from the Lewis Church of Christ. And now, here's Adam. Tribes matter. What we do every week matters. We've been, we've been spending this whole last month and then finishing up today uh, in a series called Playing for Keeps. And playing for keeps, if you're not sure, is actually a, a, a term that comes from the game of marbles, where, where you're, you go into the game knowing that whatever I win, I'm taking home with me. So every shot becomes more uh, strategic. Every thought becomes more planned out. Everything's more important. Everything has more weight to it because you're taking home the winnings. You're playing for keeps. And we want to approach, we want to approach people that way. And we've, the whole last, last month, our series has been really about approaching the next generation that way, about playing for keeps, because like, like TJ even mentioned, there's a whole lot of stuff that, that can be distracting that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, in, the, in, the whole, in all of eternity. And we can get distracted by those things, so we want to focus on really what matters most. We, we've been praying this prayer, it's, it's our memory verse from, from Psalm chapter 90, Lord, would you teach us to number our days? that we might gain a heart of wisdom, that we might know how to use our time the best way in in investing in the next generation. And so we've talked about the things that are most significant that we can give to to young people and to people in general over time. We talked about love. And how when we give someone love over time, it, it, it shows them that they have great value and great worth. And that's what God has done for us. He's used time as a platform to show us how much he loves us. We talked about our words and how powerful our words are and that our words over time have the power to impact someone's direction in life. And that's what God has done. He's given us his words from the very beginning. He spoke creation into into existence and he gives us his, his living word in Jesus and his written word in the Bible that we have over time to hear his words that impact and change our lives. Last week we, we, we had a fun time talking about how fun matters. And over time, you know, God always talks about our relationship with Him in in a way of joy and celebration and singing and dancing. And and fun matters. And when we have fun with the the next generation, with our kids over time, it it deepens our relationships. It strengthens our connections together. And we're going to finish up our sermon series today looking at tribes. Tribes over time. We all have tribes. You may not call them tribes, right? But but, but but sometimes we even define ourselves by our tribes. I'm, I'm, I'm a dad. I'm, I'm a musician, or, or I'm a biker, or I'm a Christian, or I'm a Republican, or I'm a Democrat, or I'm a whatever I am, or I'm a pirate, or seeing if you're out there, right? I know some of you are, are pirates at, you know, behind closed doors, whatever. But tribes are really just groups of people where we, we're, we're united by something in common. We're united by, by a, a common identity and a common purpose. I think my first, my first experience with tribes looking back happened all the way back in kindergarten. I was, I was the new kid in school. And, and I remember the first day of kindergarten because I, I, there was a, I moved from New Jersey to Pennsylvania and there was an age difference and so I didn't actually enter into kindergarten until after Christmas break and so I was really the new kid. Who's this kid coming in the middle of the year? And, and, and I remember this, this, this boy named Kurt who, who became my friend and just welcomed me in immediately. And it was just a couple years later, uh, this, this, another new kid from Virginia moved in in third grade. His name was Mike, and we just kind of welcomed him into our, our couple. Now we became a trio, and, and three boys, we were tight. And it was just a couple years after that, fifth or sixth grade, when, when Matt showed up. He moved in from Brooklyn, and he just changed everything. Uh, but Matt would tell you the very f- <laughs> this is this is funny. And I'm not kidding. This is the honest truth. He will tell you the story. The first day, the first day of school for him. He came into that moment, and we've all had these feelings where we're walking into a room of, of strangers, or, we're, or, or in this case, we're, we're trying to find a seat in the cafeteria for the first time, and we know, and we feel like we don't, we don't fit. And so I wanted to welcome him, so I said, you going to eat those fries? <laughs> and he kind of looked at me like, what? So he came and sat with us, and you know, we became like the four horsemen, man. We were like tight. In fact, to this very day, we're, we're best of friends. I, Mike's getting married in October, and I'll be in his wedding, and it's just a cool thing. Was my, but over the years, I've been to so many, we've, I've been involved in different groups, right? Sports, baseball, Little League, uh, different teams, basketball, uh, different organizations, all these things. And we, you understand tribes, right? That we're united around something, something in common. And, and tribes matter. 
tribes are so important. Uh, well, because, because tribes give us a place to belong. And every single person needs a place to belong. Every single person, young and old, wants a place to belong. Every person needs that. Like I said earlier, those feelings of loneliness, of awkwardness, like if, if you're walking into a room of strangers and you just, you're not sure where to go, you're not sure which little group to connect with, and, and you just feel out of place, and soon you almost feel, you almost feel rejected, almost like you're, you're wearing a Cowboys jersey at an Eagles game, you're like the only one, and it's just like, you're like the enemy. And nobody makes you feel that way, but you, make, you just feel that way because you don't know anyone, you're, and, and no one is saying, hey, come, come join our group. And those feelings, you know, we're pretty resilient people. Those feelings kind of don't last very long, right? They, we pretty much get over those pretty quickly. But, but there are times when people are made to feel that way all the time. And every time you go somewhere, you feel rejected, you feel isolated, you feel lonely, you feel all by yourself that you don't fit in. And if those feelings continue over time, major damage major impairment on the future especially if that's if that's the feeling that a young person gets every time they come somewhere tribes really matter to to empower us as people to thrive in this life basically what i'm saying is people need people i'm sure that's not a new concept for you we we need each other we need people we were created that way we were created that way. You remember when Adam was created and, and he had like the time of his life. He was walking with God. He and God, it was just the two of them and then life was good. And then God's like, hey, I got an idea. Why don't you, you know what? I'm gonna get, you name, get to name all the animals I've created. And Adam named all the animals. And, but do you remember what happened after that? Adam's, I could just like, uh, that's it. Like there's, there's nobody for me. And God's conclusion one, it's not good for man to be alone. Oftentimes we talk about that in the, in the, time, in, in the frame of marriage, but that's, that's in the frame of life. It's not good for man to be alone. And so, so God knew that, and, and so he said, you know what, I, I need to do something about this. And so over time, God has created really two primary tribes for every one of us to, to find a place to belong. And it started with Adam and Eve. And so, 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 so God goes back to Adam. It's not good for you to be alone. Go to sleep. And he takes a rib out of him and he makes Eve. He makes a companion, right? He makes someone to do life with. And, and, and shortly thereafter, we find other people happening. And I'm so thankful God created a different way to do that than just taking ribs out of people because that's, we'd all have nobody. We'd all, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't last. Anyway. And, and so, so now here we have this first tribe that God established. It's called family. It's called family. A family is the first place we understand belonging. It's a place to belong, a place to be accepted, a, a place to be known. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you belong in our family. And God's like, hey, this is really good. Let's keep doing this. And so he continues with this idea of tribes. And actually, he, he did it with 12 tribes. And so he created 12, he established these 12 tribes and, and made them, set them apart as a nation. We call them Israel. And through this nation of Israel, these 12 tribes, he sent his son Jesus. And something really cool started to happen. You know, Jesus had his own tribes too. You know that, right? You know, he had the multitude, like all the people. They're just like, hey, come and see. I want to check out what this guy's doing. And then there was his followers. And then there were his 12 disciples. And then there were his, his core group of friends, Peter, James, and John, like the three closest buddies. All part of different tribes. And so Jesus, he walks the earth and he lives his life teaching and showing and revealing God and teaching us all new things and setting the foundation for, for this idea of grace. And, and it's a new thing and he gets so many followers and, and then he dies and he's buried and he's resurrected and he ascends into heaven and shortly thereafter all the followers are in Jerusalem and there's a big persecution and they're all scattered about. They're all like, get out of here. And something really crazy happens. All over the Mediterranean, these little tiny tribes start popping up all over the place. And if, you, if, you, if you've read in the New Testament, there's a bunch of letters written by a guy named Paul. And now God said to Paul, hey, I need you to write these letters to people and kind of connect them because they're all part of these tribes. They all have their own faith, their own, their own traditions and customs and their own struggles. And I need you to connect them all together and make them see that they're smaller tribes, but they're all connected in one big tribe. They're all united under the, the same, a common identity and purpose, and the common identity is Jesus. And the common purpose is, is sharing the gospel and the love of Christ and making disciples. And, and so God created the family as one tribe, and the other tribe we call 
the church. The word in the, word in, in, in the Bible is ecclesia. Ecclesia, it's, a church isn't a building, it's not a place, it's not a location, you know that, right? The church is people, it's a group, it's a tribe, it's a movement. You can shut the doors of a building, you can't shut the doors of a church, of the church. And so God created this, these two tribes, two primary tribes, two tribes to belong, two tribes that play for keeps because there's so much at stake that, that neither one of them can fail. Because things are so important. And you see, everyone is looking for a place to belong. Everyone is looking, looking uh, to be known and to be accepted and to be forgiven and to be welcomed in in spite of their failures or their shortcomings. And that's what we have in these two tribes. I, there's really only two possible tribes that that can happen in. Family and the church. So often all the other tribes we talk about, all the other groups we fit into, you, ha- you have to be a certain thing to fit that. I, I, I don't fit real well in a mom's group. I wear that hat sometimes, I'm not going to lie to you, but I don't, someone, some, one of these things is different from the rest, you know? Sometimes you have, to, you have to be a certain thing, or you have to know a certain person, or you have to act a certain way, or you have to be skilled enough to be a part of this group. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's qualifiers. And that makes all the other groups exclusive. Because if you don't meet these requirements, well, you, don't, you, you can't be in our group. You don't fit. That's not the family. That's not the church. See, God's tribes are inclusive. Everybody's invited. There's a really cool illustration of this, and it's probably a familiar story to you. It's in Luke chapter 15. And I'll paraphrase the beginning of it. Luke chapter 15, you probably have heard it as like the prodigal son or the lost son. And so Jesus is telling the story of this, this one, a younger of two sons who, who just can't wait for his dad to die. And he really wants his inheritance and he wants it now. And so he goes to his dad and says, hey, I, I, I want to I wanna go. I want to leave here. I'm done living under your roof. I'm going to go do my own thing. Can you give me my stuff so I can get out of here? I mean, like just total disrespect just totally severing and breaking that relationship in a major major way and he does he get dad gives him his stuff and he takes off and he's he does his thing he's living his life and life is good for a while and the cool part about this story is is it's so easy to see ourselves in the story right and and so he goes off and the bible says he squandered everything and it's not long before he realizes he's got nothing he's living on the streets and the Bible says that he came to his senses and he, he hired himself out to, be, to, to serve the slop to pigs. That's how bad it got. It got so bad he was longing after just to have a meal of what the pigs were having. And when he came to his senses, he started thinking, you know, the servants in my dad's house, they eat really good. They've got a roof over their head. They, they've got sandals on their feet. They've got clothes. Like They have it good. But I really messed things up. Man, I messed things up. I, I don't even know if I can go. You know, I wonder. I know he'll never take me back as a son. I'll never belong like that. But maybe he'll take me back just as a servant, a hired hand, just, just so I can, can have a, a meal to eat. And that's his approach. Have you been there? Ah, oh, man, I've messed up so bad. I don't know if my father will ever take me back. He's taken me back a bunch of times, but this is the same thing again. And... I just don't know if he'll even accept me back. And so he tries. And let's, I want to pick up in, in Luke chapter 15, verse 20. It, it says, you know, he went back to his dad. And, and while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. (laughs) But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and so they began to celebrate. Isn't that an awesome story? Did you see the idea of tribes in there? Dad welcomed his son back. You know, son came back to say, he had all this, these things planned out to say, and dad didn't even let him get a word. I don't care about any of that. You're home. 
You were lost, and now you're back where you belong. And he put, he put the family ring on his finger. You know what that communicates? You still have a place. You still belong in this family. And then he had a celebration. He invited everybody. You know, back then, everybody, everybody in the town was Jewish. They were all went to the same church, the same synagogue, right? They were all together. It was a community of faith. And he invited everybody, and they all celebrated that he was back. And that communicates, you know what? You still belong to this community of faith, to this group of believers. You still fit here. His dad, his dad got it, man. His dad, you know, communicated, there's still a seat for you at our table. And this, this is a place where, where we know you. We know you. But you can be known here, and you can be accepted here, and you can be forgiven here. That, that's what it means to belong. And you know what I know? Kids and teenagers and adults and older adults, senior saints, we all need that. We're desperately looking for a place where we can be known. We're desperately longing for a place where, where we'll be accepted and where we'll be forgiven regardless of what we've done in the past. We, that's what we want. That's what we need. God knew that. And so we established the family and the church. Those are the two places those things can happen. And they can happen because at the core of those two, God established things as this incredible thing called grace. Nowhere else do you find grace. Nowhere else do you find it. You know, you don't belong because you deserve it. You don't belong because you're someone special and you've done something better than somebody else. You don't belong because you have a certain skill or you, you know somebody and so you're in. You belong because God's grace says you belong. You belong because God says, you know what, I accept you. This is a God who knows, knows you better than anybody else on planet earth. He knows every thought in your mind. He knows every word you've ever spoken and not. He knows everything you've done and thought about doing. And yet he still welcomes you into his own tribe forever. That's grace. And I just, I think for us to be able to give that to someone else, especially when they're young, could just be the greatest thing you could ever, ever do. Uh, and it happens in tribes. <laughs> it happens in those groups. It happens in family and church where, where the kids have a place to belong and a place to be known and a place to be accepted and a place to be forgiven and where they, can, they start to understand this concept of grace. And so this, this tribes thing, you know, it's, it's a little bit different than the other things we've talked about because tribes, it, it involves belonging. The tribes, it involves other people. And so how do we, what can we do this week? We've been talking about, hey, we need to do things every week because every week matters. Weeks on top of weeks on top of weeks. So this cumulative effect, well, what can we do to connect our kids to tribes? And I'm just so thankful that so many of you are asking that question. I wasn't sure if you'd ask that, but I know you are. And if you're not, so what? I'm going to answer it anyway. That's kind of what I got here. I don't ever like to end a sermon with, okay, there it is. Have a good day. Like we always want to, this Bible's meant for transformation, so what can we do with it, right? What can we do this week that, that we, can, we can help our kids and, and people connect with tribes? And so there's tribes, there's family and church, so I've got two for you, one for each one. And, and the first one, as parents, can you, can you consistently and be better at, at, at giving your kids five? Give them a five. And I don't mean give them a high five. Now, I love give them a high five. That's encouragement. That's, you know, that says, hey, that communicates, look, you belong. We're together. We're a team. Like, we're together in this. But I, I have this thing. I, you know, on my phone, I have several hundred contacts. And I'm sure you, you might have more than that. You might have half of that. I don't know. But I've got several hundred contacts in my phone, and I, I don't know, half of them. And, you know, a lot of those people don't know me very well. We don't know each other very deeply. But I have this other list. And maybe you've got this. It's a favorites list. And those are the people you call the most. Those are the people that are closest to you. Those are the people who know you inside and out, who know the good, bad, and ugly. Those are the people who aren't just great friends, but they're great advisors. And I probably have a, a, a handful of those that just by a touch of a screen, they're a text or an email or a phone call away. 
you probably have those people, right? Who do your kids have? It's a great question. Who do your kids have? Who do your kids go to talk to when they, know, when they need to talk about something? Now, I know they, aside from mom and dad, aside from their friends, friends are limited. I just know that, that sometimes the, the last place a 16-year-old needs to get advice is from another 16-year-old. And I know the last place oftentimes that a kid wants, the last person a kid wants to talk to is their parents. And I, I just know this. I don't have teenagers, but I know as they grow older, they become more and more independent. And there's sometimes they, just, they don't want to talk to me or mom about something, but they need to talk to somebody. Who will they go to? I just know that if, if I can put a handful of adults in their lives that I trust, that I've helped cultivate relationships that I know what they're going to say, they're going to say the same thing that I would say. <sighs> Praise the Lord. Go talk to them. That's fine with me. Because the fact is, they're going to talk to somebody. And if you don't have those people there, who knows what information they're getting? And so I would suggest, give them five. Who are your five people? Who are your five adults? And I guarantee you probably have people coming to mind right now. From between your grand, the grandparents and aunts and uncles and other family members and coaches and church family and neighbors and teachers you could probably put together a good group, right? Five people who know them, who know their hopes and dreams, who know their quirks and their good points. Five people who can honestly speak into their lives truth and wisdom, who will care for them, who will pray for them. And if you don't know that five, you're not alone, and there's something you can do about it. Over the course of the next few weeks, I would just, let's identify some of these people. I know, I know these people. I, I have these people. I've thought about, I, this is really important to have because there's a, there's a really cool book. It's called Parenting Beyond Your Capacity. This is the way God designed it, the church and the family. We're not, we're not capable of meeting every single need for our kids. That's why we have this body of faith, this community of faith. We have the church. If Deuteronomy 6, when, when Moses said, I want you to impress these things on your kids, he wasn't just talking to parents. He was talking to the entire nation of Israel. He was talking to the church family too. Who are those people that can speak into your kids' lives. Every kid, I, I think every kid needs at least five adults that, that on, their, on their favorite list. And, and if we have those, if we help put those into our kids' lives, I just wonder if, well, if we'll be ra- seeing a, a, a new and different generation start to, start to rise up and emerge. Give your kids five. And as a church, let me give you one more. As a church, give them a seat. How many of you have seen Forrest Gump if you've not, you need to. It's just like it's life, man. You just got to see it at some point. Forrest Gump, it, it, it's a great story. And, and, but in, in the beginning of the movie, he's, he's, on, he's at his first day of school. And he, and he gets onto the school bus and he looks down that long, long aisle in the school bus. Remember that, your first day of school? And he's walking down the aisle and everybody communicates the same thing. Seats taken. Seats taken. This seat's taken, you know, slot. I'm nobody sitting with me, but this seat's not for you. Until he, see, until he hears the sweetest voice in the whole wide world. Right? Jenny. Jenna. You remember what Jenny says? You can sit here if you like. Such a small gesture. Such a big thing. There's always going to be kids. There's always going to be people who don't have a place to sit. Who always feel like they're always on the outside. Who always get the vibe, you don't belong here. You don't fit here. This isn't a place for you. May that never be true of the Lord's church. And so I would encourage you, give them a seat. Let people know that they fit. They don't have to be somebody they're not. They don't have to do anything special. They just fit because of grace. Let them fit in your circle. That goes for someone who's sitting by themselves in a pew to the person you see every day walking the neighborhood by themselves. Let them know that they fit Give them a seat in your circle. You do it. Don't wait for the church leaders or someone else to do it. Give them a seat. We made it a family value. It's a family value. One of our family values in our family is we look for lonely people. 
We want to be kind, we want to be encouraging, and we look for lonely people. Why? Because everybody needs a place to belong. And may this be our our family value as, as the family of God, that no one stays alone. Everyone needs a place to belong. You give them a seat. I'm confident you came in here this morning and, and didn't, this isn't a new thing, like, man, people matter? Hey, you know, people in my life? Sweet. It's a new thing. No, that's not new. I, even a lone ranger didn't do anything alone. Like, he wasn't lone. We, we need people. And my prayer this morning was just that, that it might re, help us rethink what that means because we, we, we have an incredible opportunity to, to, to offer kids a place to belong forever. We call them tribes. God called them tribes. I'm calling them tribes, right? And everything you do this week to connect kids and teenagers in tribes matters because every child needs a place to belong. Every teenager, every person needs a place where people believe in them over time. It's, it's how they will know they're accepted. It's how they will feel forgiven. And it may just be the best way for them to understand the concept of God's incredible grace don't waste your days number them that you might gain a heart of wisdom and lead your kids this has been a presentation of the lewis church of christ we are located at 15183 coastal highway milton delaware three miles north of lewis on highway one our service times are 9 a.m and 11 a.m every sunday morning 